Yes, we're up. Alright. That's good. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're good. Alright, so this is the uh, Progressive Community Forum. It's uh, 10 a.m. on Saturday the 15th. So. Irish hip hop, you don't want to go there, trust me. Mic check, mic check. Okay, how about. We do good rebel songs, but not very good hip hop. Okay, that's good. It does do the same all throughout the Right. So we're good? Okay, yeah, I think this is good. Okay. All right, so let's get this show on the road. Um, we're going to start off with uh, Patricia, is going to do a um, Ojibwe uh, opening blessing and ceremony. I don't know if it's possible if we can kind of get in a circle. I mean, I don't know if that's possible. I think it's better if we do that. Um, if we can just form a quick circle, uh, maybe up here, even somewhere in here, move some chairs out of the way. Um, we do things in a circle. <laughs> And, um, and that 
um, I, I was initiated into a medicine lodge, which gives me the right to be able to do this, to do this part for people. I mean, so I do, I am sanctioned to be able to do this. Um, so anyway, I just want to start out by saying, um, <laughs> Hey, get, anybody, would you mind um, kind of moving up to the front here, here, um, so that when this year is being taped, we'll make sure that people see the audience participation. That'll also be for the for the live stream as well. Yeah, I mean, I was going to keep the, the audience out of the view, basically. I did not stand over earlier, but, but, but the YouTube won't. So. Oh, okay, right, yeah. So, all right, let's do, let's do some um, just kind of general maintenance stuff first. Um, out of respect of all the speakers, oh. The, the, the flyers are back there. Is the actual rostrum of the speakers? We have them right there. First we, thing first so we'll pass those out in just a little bit. Um, housekeeping stuff. The bathrooms are right back there. They're um, they're male and female both. So just uh, open bathrooms are back there, right back to that door right there, and off to the um, off to the dark side to the right. Um, for all of you who have a government-approved surveillance device. I'm talking about your cell phone. Um, you please turn your government approved surveillance devices off. Please turn your cell phones off in respect for uh, the people that are speaking. So, first of all, I want to thank you all for, for being here. Um, and just to kind of explain how this thing got started very quickly. We did this in Duluth, and the results that we got in Duluth was exceeded our wildest expectations. So we actually uh, decided to start doing it on the road. And I will tell you folks that we're actually getting contacted from Rochester, Mankato, Red Wing, Bemidji, and I believe a couple of other towns and states all throughout Minnesota, um, as well as St. Paul, by the way, to uh, replicate what we're doing here. And uh, th this is, the idea is, the whole idea of this is to have a um, non-establishment sanctioned place for progressives to go, and where we learn and talk t and discuss with each other with the insistence that we have two guiding principles that we're honest and that we're respectful. We can have disagreements, we can even have tactical or strategic disagreements, that's fine. But we should be talking to each other rather than talking at each other. So that's kind of the whole point of this. Um, and I, I got to, I'm very, very excited about this so far. And, and I'm excited about what can come out of this. So, You guys, it's an honor to be amongst you bunch of rogues, miscreants, 
Malkin's heads, known as the voices of dissent, known as you guys are the conscience of this nation. It is an honor to be amongst you all. Um, starting this thing off, something I have to say. The planet is dying. That's how serious this is. Our planet is dying. So let's have an honest conversation about how to move forward, including conversations about co-optation and subverting and people trying to stop what we're doing. Also, an honest conversation about how to work together and how to talk to each other and listen to each other and work with each other instead of against each other. You know, let's talk about honesty. Where are we at right now? Whether it's betrayals of President Obama in regards to the tar sands, banking, I mean, you name the issues. Whether it's the betrayals of the Obama administration in where we're at today, or indeed, whether it's Governor Dayton, Governor Dark Mark Dayton, who ran on taxing the 2% as a, as, a, as a main campaign issue, and when he became elected, then shoved down the Vikings' corporate welfare grant down our throats against our permission and against the law. We need to be honest about who we are and where we are and these so-called leaders that we have. We need to be honest about where we're really at and not just talk about what we want. This is about stopping listening to what any politician says and instead watch what he does. Now, I want to talk to you guys about uh, single-payer health care. And I'm going to talk about, actually, specifically about the John Marty Bill. Now, the John Marty Bill actually isn't single-payer. It's not perfect, but it's good. It's a great start. It is somebody who's actually in office, who's actually pushing for something resembling single, real single-payer health care, which, by the way, Obamacare is not. But what happened to John Marty's bill, as imperfect as it is, and I watched this at the Capitol, and I'm, going to, and I'm going to mention names and organizations. And I've had this confirmed, by the way, by members of the Minnesota House. When John Martin was pushing his bill forward, his party leadership fought that bill to put forward the bill that they have right now, which is a version of Obamacare, which is a pandering to the corporate insurance companies. And in John Marty's bill, as it was passing in, in, our, in our capital in St. Paul, we had groups. We had Take Action Minnesota. We had the Minnesota Nurses Association. We had Isaiah. All of these progressive organizations were actually sabotaging John Marty's bill and went and talked to members of the Minnesota House and Senate and asked them to not support John Marty's bill, but instead support the bill that the Democratic Party leadership was pushing forward. Now at that time, the, uh, one of the top leaders of, of the Democratic Party was actually married to a chief financial officer for, um, I believe it was United Healthcare. That means we can say with a great deal of honesty that the Democratic Party establishment was literally in bed with the corporate insurance healthcare corporations, both figuratively and literally. This is honesty, this is an honest conversation. And groups like Take Action and Isaiah and indeed SEIU and other organizations need to be called out on that, as does the trade union leadership. These people are selling us out for I don't know what reason, but they are, they're selling us out. So let's have an honest conversation about that. Now, that's the problem. The problem is the problem. I say what we do now is we take a look at what that problem is and then look more importantly at the solution. I will tell you, there's two ways that I look at this as an individual and as an activist. We need to take a look at our own Minnesota history. In Minnesota, we had an organization which developed, which by the way, I see what we're doing here being the germinations of a brand new version of that. It was called the Farmer Labor Association. 
And that Farmer Labor Association fought against the establishment. And at one time, in the 30s and 40s, we had, in this state here in Minnesota, we had a Farmer Labor governor. We had a majority in the House for the Farmer Labor Party. And we always had a majority in the Senate. And sadly, the, the leaders of the Farmer Labor Association have said repeatedly that the worst mistake they ever made was to join the Democratic Party. And they're very clear on that, and we can see why. I talk about John Marty's bill as a perfect example of that. But personally, I ask us as activists, look north, my sisters. Look north, my brothers. Canada. Canada at one time had two corporate parties. And then another group came into existence. It was called the National, the NDP, National Democratic Party. And their version of Floyd Olson, the governor there of uh, Saskatchewan, uh, what's his name again? Come on, folks, you've got to know this. Come on, all you lefties. Tommy Douglas. Governor Tommy Douglas from Saskatchewan became the leader of the, of the NDP. And in Saskatchewan, because they created an actual, real, strong, united, and viable, anti-corporate, pro-union, pro-ordinary people, pro-we the 99% minded party, actually fought, and for, by the way, just for the record, for them, single pair was their compromise. They were actually going for a nationally united healthcare system just like what they have in Britain. And if an Irishman's talking about something good in Britain, you know that's something pretty frickin' big. <laughs> <laughs> that's the way to move forward, quite frankly, in my own opinion. Breaking free from the current corporate corrupted structure, and more importantly, making sure that those who try and push us back into it, what I've called the veal pan of politics, which is the current two establishment parties, will do nothing. There's a man I, I once met that I, that I quote all the time. The Democratic Party is where progressive politics and progressive social justice movements go to die. So when we have people telling us to stay within that corporate establishment system, they're asking us to kill the progressive social justice movement. I say no. What about you guys? No. All right. So that's my pitch. Um, where is the uh, roster? I need to see who's next. I believe you're next, Nate. Yes. Um, and by the way, we have, oh, thank you. Uh -huh. So next is, is uh, Nate Ness. Nate, let me tell you guys, this guy, I have so much respect for this man. Seriously, I've got so much respect for him. He gets it. And he gets something that we need to hear, we need to think about. We need to figure out about effective organizing. Not non-effective, not symbolic, but how to effectively and realistically work and organize so that we can build this social justice movement we're talking about. Thank you, Nate Ness. Thank you. And I am recording on my phone because I like to have access right away. Um, thank you to Bill for filming this, by the way. And, and to Michael for organizing this thing, I think it's, uh, it's just real encouraging to see this kind of thing happening still. Um, in a time where we need it the most, um, my background, just to be real quick, my name is Nathan Ness. Uh, I used to work for the Service Employees International Union, so I know everything about losing on purpose and doing really, really strong organizing. <laughs> a combination of being trained really well, um, being able to mobilize a lot of people, and then being able to fucking uh, put the brakes on and, and quit on purpose, right, when we're supposed to you know, move forward and, and win. Um, and my one metaphor that I like to use is when it comes to organizing, um, it's kind of like whoever fills up the bathtub with water is also the one who can, who can pull the plug and, and drain it. So unfortunately, that's what the Democratic Party tends to do. Um, and I'm done with that. I don't know about you guys. Uh, I noticed a few copies of Death of a Liberal Class in the back. How many people have read that? So Chris Hedges, Death of a Liberal. Okay. What what Hedges says in that book is um, all of the pillars of the liberal class have collapsed, 
and I think we need to we need to think about whether or not that's true. Um, this this group is a good indication of the possibility of, of rising up and creating a new pillar that that can um, that can hold something. But we don't have that now, and I think we need to to recognize that. Um, so I've done you know I worked for Move to Amend, uh, another example of just you know hey. Good, good idea, let's get big money out of politics, but who there is willing to actually hold their local representative accountable and say, Representative Nolan, Representative Keith Ellison, will you voluntarily reject big money out of your own campaign? Um, Keith Ellison won't. We asked him to reject big oil money after the BP oil spill, he wouldn't do it. Um, why do you think that is? Representative Nolan is all about getting uh, you know, ending Pentagon spending, getting the big Pentagon spending out of out of Congress, but will he voluntarily reject any of that money? No. Uh, we we need to hold these folks accountable. And <clears throat> my my problem with with a lot of folks in the Democratic Party, I used to be there. I used to be one of them. They you know they gave me a ton of access. They gave me a seat at the table, and doesn't that feel special? Uh, <laughs> But they only give a seat to the, uh, at the table to people who they don't expect to actually do anything to them. My whole thing is accountability. If there's no consequence for, for screwing us over, that's all they're going to do. And the only people who get a seat at the table are the ones who are going to just basically get, get uh, hammered until they're irrelevant. Um, or, or they won't even notice that they haven't won, they haven't gotten anything. Um, in that, in that establishment DFL um, whole network, what they do is they criticize your tone. If you, you say any of this stuff, they say, well, boy, don't you have a negative tone. <laughs> and I say, the ice caps are melting. Uh, poly, you know, PolyMed is coming into northern Minnesota to pollute our water, the cleanest water in the country, um, some of the cleanest water in the world, water being something that will one day be worth more money than oil. And if that doesn't get to the, to the right wing and inspire them, it's cash. And they still want to pollute it um, for 20 years worth of jobs. And so the world is, is literally ending. And if somebody wants to criticize my tone, if I seem frustrated about that, um, I just say, well, fuck off. <laughs> you know? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I was hoping people would, would share it. <laughs> um, and so, as an organizer at this point, I'm, I'm pretty much ready to either be relevant or quit altogether. When I started, I was making $30,000 a year, which is okay. Later on, I was making 45, then 60. And then it's all been downhill from there because I stopped working for the Democratic Party. Now I'm fucking in poverty. Sorry for swearing so much. <laughs> I'm Norwegian, and uh, it's pretty early for me. Um, <laughs> and you know, poverty uh, upsets me quite a bit. You know, the last the last gig SEIU offered me was in California, making sixty five thousand dollars a year, living in a Marriott, driving a rental car, and getting a forty five dollar per day you know per diem, and that's that's attractive. I would love that, uh, but I'm not going to work for an organization that does the exact opposite of what they pretend to be doing. Uh, it's not worth it. Raiding other unions in California, I mean, I did that. <laughs> so, as an organizer now, in order to be relevant, and in order to be able to kind of live with myself, and um, I'm, lo I'm looking for people who are full of hate. <laughs> that's, that's right, I, I want to find haters. Haters are wanted, let's find the haters. <laughs> Uh, let that be our organizing mantra. Uh, if you hate corruption, act like it. Act like you hate it. We deserve to hate it. Uh, if you hate legalized bribery, hold your local elected official accountable. Say, how much money are you taking from, from oil companies? How much are you taking from the military industrial complex? Because I've worked for a lot of organizations that pretended to hold these folks accountable, but we, you know, we were too nice to them. What they're doing is monstrous, and we need to hate that. They're putting GMOs in our food. I mean, it's uh, they're my, but my main concern right now is fighting against sulfide mining. And 
I'm really encouraged by you know people like Patricia over here and Idle No More and Protect the uh, Protect the Monoman. Mm -hmm. The the Native American groups are doing the best work on sulfide mining. And yeah, let's give that a round of applause. And um, before I launch into this, this whole bit about sulfide mining, I just want to say there are three things that every grassroots organizing campaign should be able to answer. One, what do we want? What is our objective? Two, who makes the decisions? Three, can we affect those decisions? And if so, how? Um, you'd be surprised at how many organizations don't, they can't answer any of those questions. Or if they do, they lie about it. They say, oh, um, we need to educate the general public about polymed, and then we'll win. Well, that's not true. And the Sierra Club knows that. Um, Water Legacy knows that. They're, they're looking for clicks on the donation button. That's a fact. Um, and I'm from Duluth. I am from northern Minnesota. Um, when I was really active in Occupy Duluth and Occupy uh, Minneapolis, and um, I was really focused on when Take Action Minnesota came up to Duluth and actually co-opted the thing. That was funded by SCIU, my former employers. And they came up there and <clears throat> they actually marginalized discussions about sulfide mining, Take Action Minnesota, backed by SCIU. They said, don't organize around sulfide mining. The union said this up there. They said, if you talk about sulfide mining, we will disassociate from you. <laughs> And so maybe some of the people here can guess what I did at that point. <laughs> um, I invited Protect the Minoman and some, some other uh, Native American groups to, to join an Occupy event in Duluth. To that point, they hadn't been there. Uh, they hadn't really been involved. And we, we did it. We, we made sulfide mining the main issue up there. And the unions disassociated publicly and tried to smear me in the newspaper. It just so happens that I'm better at controlling the media out there than they are. Um, and so everything worked out, but... Uh, and what was the basis of this disassociation? I mean, does it come down to, we want jobs for a few of our members for a yeah. few years, so screw any other consideration? Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and it's not everybody in the labor movement up there, it's about half of them. There's a guy, Craig Olson, who works for, for one of the building trade unions, and. Uh, he just strong-armed the, the union leadership up in Duluth. Um, half of the people that publicly support PolyMed from the unions in Duluth privately don't. You know, I really understand that this is part of why the union is going down. It's not just the Koch brothers and Allen. It's because they don't want to Yeah, they're, they're really, yeah, they think, they think in the short term. And uh, so I got to make a speech up at Occupy Duluth, and it was, it was right when we started putting the sulfide mining issue on the table there. Um, after the speech, we actually marched, there was like 30 of us, we marched on to the Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce, something I had been wanting to do for, for months up there. <laughs> and I made a speech that was good enough to, like, imagine us in this room, uh, we marched down to the Minneapolis Chamber of Commerce, storm in there, this is what we did. It's up on YouTube if you, if you type Nathan Ness in Duluth Area Chamber of Commerce. <laughs> uh, it's, it's quite a bit of fun. Um, and what, what that did is it, it made the unions have to decide at that moment, are you with the Chamber of Commerce or are you with us? <laughs> the next day in the paper, they're, you know, they're just smearing my name and saying, oh, he's trying to divide us. And I said, yeah, and you're trying to use the Occupy Duluth movement to get Obama reelected, to get Rick Nolan reelected, even though that's not what this is about. We're not a Democratic Party front group. Um, after that, um, we, did, uh, we did a protest on the Kitchigami Club in Duluth. 150 people showed up out in the cold. The Sierra Club, Water Legacy, all these groups would not help us one bit with turnout on that. The PolyMed executive, uh, this PolyMed spokesperson actually said, we've never been protested by this many people before. And 
as an organizer, that's a great thing to hear. Um, and we had no support from the Sierra Club. I just asked, I asked Margaret Levin, the, the ED, I said, will you send out a mass email to your members up in that area? And she said, no, you know. And, and the I, reason was? Because she's locked in with the Democratic Party and we were unpredictable. And by the way, if you're not unpredictable in organizing, these groups as well. you yeah, that's why I'm mentioning this. Um, Water Legacy said, they tried to reverse organize the thing. They said, don't do this. Don't do this. And then, and then they said, but if you're, gonna, if you're gonna do it, will you hand out our lit? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, sure, if you pay for it, you know. <laughs> so, yeah, they didn't want anything to do with it, but they did want their lit being spread around. Um, and that, that was a great media hit. We had like, you know, we had every, every news, every news uh, channel and, every, and the newspaper covered it. How much time do I have, Michael? Two minutes. All right, so the whole point is, um, if anybody, I, I'm really here to recruit folks. I wanna do some <laughs> badass uh, organizing in the Twin Cities on Polymet. I wanna bird dog people like Representative Jason Metza, who is a, he's a, he's a state legislator from Virginia. He is an organizer. He's like the, the version of me that doesn't give a fuck about the environment. And so we have to stand up against that. And I'd like to announce that I, I think it's way past time that we protest the governor's mansion over this. The Sierra Club and Water Legacy will, will never ad, ad acknowledge the fact that Dayton is one target that we can press everything on. Um, so. Well, one of the first things Dayton did was fast track the permitting. Yeah. So, anyway, thank you for your time. Okay. Uh, did, you, did you want to say something? Yeah. I just wanted to say that, you know, Governor Dayton does not live in his mansion. He lives in his private house somewhere. Yeah. But he doesn't live on some of that. Yeah. I do, though. So, it's convenient for me to do it. <laughs> um, so, yeah. I just I, I would like to do it at his mansion whether he's there or not. We can we can protest to his servants or whatever to his butler. Um, but that's that's what we need to do. And I can hand out my business card to anybody who wants to participate in something like that. So I think I'm gonna just respect the time and hand it back to you. So thank you all for listening. Does that guy rock or what? Yes. All right, great deal of pride right now. Um, I'd like to um, bring up Patricia Shepard from Idle and Mark. Yay! Another rock star. <laughs>